everybody doing this morning? Outstanding. Come on. How's everybody doing this morning? Tired. Better. Oh, tired. That's good. It's good to be honest. That's not a bad thing. Um, so every night when I go to bed, I thank God for blessing me with the day that he gave me. When I wake up in the morning, I thank him again and ask him to please bless the day that's coming before me. So we thought it was very appropriate to start our song, our worship this morning with the song, I Am Blessed. If you would like to stand up and join us, you are more than welcome. If you'd like to stay seated, you are welcome to do whatever makes you welcome. because they like winter, uh, yeah, but I'm like, you know, this is all going to be gone in 30 days. Oh, We're the worst summer to get that in. Uh, we, uh, we don't really have much for announcements today. Uh, the only announcement that I can really think of is our youth ministry kicks off on the 23rd of uh, September at the Wolf Lake Park, and uh, that, is, that event is going to be from 6 to 8. Eight, not eight, uh, eight. And uh, because of the location, we're likely looking forward to doing some carpooling. So if uh, we have a uh, messenger group that we communicate through, if you're looking to get a ride uh, to that event sometime between now and a couple days before, if you could just let us know, we could plan for our drivers. And, uh, the meal is going to be provided. We're just asking people to bring something to drink. Um, 
And so speaking of meals, uh, today we are having a meal after our service, and you're welcome to join us if uh, you're a guest with us today. We'd love to have you for lunch. And uh, I, to the best of my knowledge, I don't, I don't know that we're taking offerings for anything today. Our, our speaker uh, with us, we're compensating him. So we want you to get the most possible benefit and blessing out of being here today. And uh, is that okay? Yes. 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 I mean, if, if, it, if you would like to, you know, raise your hand if you want to be robbed. Uh, go home and get my sidearm, come back. Okay, got one kid. Did you bring your wallet? Because if you want to be robbed, you better have a wallet. Uh, all right, so, no, we want to uh, just enjoy being here today. We've got a great message uh, from our guest, uh, Pastor Kevin McClure, and uh, we'll introduce him in a bit. And so, but before we go on, just in case I missed something, is there anybody that has an announcement today that I'm not aware of? Um, okay. How about birthdays or anniversaries? Got some guests, so, you know, maybe they won't lie. All right. Larry and Marlene celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary mm -hmm. yesterday. <laughs> Were any of you there? Because it doesn't sound like it was much of a celebration. <laughs> if none of their friends and family were there, well, we uh, we just bless you two. And so, can we sing Happy Anniversary? Larry and Marlene. Happy Anniversary to you. Just before Kevin uh, gets up and I introduce him, uh, our worship group is going to sing the Lord's Prayer to us and for us and to the Lord today. And so somebody help me remember that. We're trying to figure out where to put it. Um, and then uh, we're going to listen to a great message. We're going to have some prayer. And uh, so if you're here today, I'm going to give you a heads up. If you're here today and you need prayer, you're going to have an opportunity to receive prayer. We would consider it an honor to take your needs before the Lord. So there's a heads up about that. And then we'll wrap it up and we'll go have a, a great meal together. That sound all right? Yeah. Three of you. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you that are guests, this is normal. This is what I deal with. We get and we go. All right. Well, looks like I'll be eating a lot today. So, well, could we stand together and pray and let the worship man lead us. <coughs> Lord, we're so thankful today to be here, to be in this place, to lift up your name, and to have an opportunity to be together, and to not be afraid of people coming in to shut us down, uh, but we're gathering here in a country that's still free, and we give you thanks for that. We ask, Lord, that you'd move in our midst, we pray that we would uh, open our, be able to open our hearts to you and that you would be able to touch us, that we wouldn't leave here the same as we came in, that we would be encouraged and strengthened and built up in our faith. And we ask you, Lord, uh, to do that. And we also ask you to help us as we worship you, to worship you with our whole heart. Yes. Lord, your, your word promises that, that you actually turn to strengthen those that are focused on you with their whole heart. So, Lord, I want to be a person that's focused on you with my whole heart, and I pray that for my brothers and sisters today. We ask that you would help us. We love you today, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
sing this again. Could we do that? Could we stretch ourselves a little bit out of our comfort zone and just say, God, I give you all of me before you. And I sing the fire of the Lord and raise my hands to you because you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords and my soul will worship you.
realize we don't have it on the screen, but if you'll allow me to read what we would normally say together, some of you maybe know it. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. Uphold us by your spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us and forgive us our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen us in our goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us to eternal life. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It is, uh, it is my honor uh, to bring my good friend, Kevin McClure before you today, and uh, so before he stands up and makes his way here, um, Kevin and I got to know each other in 2008 when I went back to school. I went to seminary in the cities. After 15 years of serving the ministry, I finally went back to seminary. And so uh, I've, I've always been a little bit out of order, and most of you know that. Um, so Kevin uh, was my mentor. Every student at the Master's Institute gets a mentor for the full three years they're there. And we met an hour a week, every week, during the school year, for three years. And uh, Kevin is a, how do I describe it? Do you know, um, have you ever got to know somebody and, and felt the love of God to that person. That's what it was like. And, and so I felt the love of God through Kevin toward me. And, uh, and, and like most times when I feel the love of God, I know full well that I don't deserve the love of God. And so it's amazing. And so we walked together, and, and uh, thankfully we've continued to kind of walk together uh, after the seminary. That was, you know, 12 years ago already. And so... Uh, Kevin is a very experienced man of God, experienced in the Word, experienced in prayer, and uh, and I guarantee you today that you're going to be blessed. I just ask you to open your heart. He's pretty straightforward, and uh, so we had a pretty good. So, men that were there Friday night, do you have a good night? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a good night. See, there's more than three of them. So that's <laughs> good. I'll speak for the who's at work. Yeah. So we had a delightful night, Friday night, uh, and uh, Kevin spoke to us and encouraged us. And so I'm hoping, Kevin, would you come on up here? I'd like to pray for you before we begin. But, you know, I could go on and on about Kevin, but we're, we're really here to hear the Word of God, and I, I think you'll see uh, most of what I could say um, without me saying. And so can we pray together? Yes. Um, Lord, we just thank you for this servant of God. We thank you for his heart for you and for his heart for God's people. And we pray today that, uh, that you would bless him, encourage him, and, and lead him as he brings to us a word and uh, from the word of God. That we would hope, have the scriptures opened up to us uh, and give us life today. We pray that you bless him and encourage him. And Lord, we just trust you uh, because you're the almighty God who oversees uh, everything. And so we ask you for these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can we say it together? Amen. Amen. siblings. My mother was married and divorced twice, had two families, and yet I'm very close to my, my half-siblings, and I was, I was raised with their children. I have uh, four nieces and nephews who are older than me, and uh, 
We were uh, a blue collar family, worked and lived in a blue collar neighborhood of the city of Chicago, and we're used to getting our hands dirty. And uh, we were Catholics and we knew a fair amount about Jesus, but we hadn't yet experienced Jesus in a personal way. It's interesting being Irish, people tend to take a certain amount of pride in their heritage. I know there are a lot of Finns here in this area. I've done a lot of research and I discovered that Jesus was actually Irish. <laughs> I found three irrefutable evidences. First, you know, Jesus lived at home until he was 30. <laughs> he had no visible means of support. And he had a mother who thought he was God. There you have it. Jesus, Irish, absolutely. In any case, uh, I went away to college in southeastern Minnesota, and uh, there was a guy, I, I wrestled in college, and there was a guy in the wrestling team I admired as an athlete but didn't like as a person. He never seemed to smile. Every other word was, was wow. I used to say, he could say it backwards, wow. Uh, he was what you call a hippie job. He was a rare kind of person. He was his own man. And um, one day he came to practice visibly transformed. And I said, I need to know what happened to you. And he said, I, I experienced Jesus. And I said, you gotta, gotta tell me more. I, in those days, believed that Jesus was not only the Son of God, but God the Son. I believed in the virgin birth. I believed that the Bible was God's word. But I only believed on an intellectual basis. I didn't have what you might call a heart faith. And I said to him, I want to experience what you've experienced. And he invited me to accompany him to a Bible study. And uh, I went. And at this Bible study, I found people were welcoming, they were humble, and they were happy to answer questions, but they weren't overly aggressive. They were just everything I needed. They encouraged me to go home to my dorm room and have a conversation with Jesus later that evening, which I did. It was March of 1972. I was 18 years of age. I got down on my knees like a good Catholic kid and had that conversation. I knew I was a sinner. I didn't need to be convinced of it. The Catholic faith had informed me about sin. It identified what sin is. It used God's law to help me to see this is sinful. And then they did a very good job of helping me to see there are consequences to sin. And I remember feeling very worried about facing those consequences. I was, I was quite convinced that if I died, then I would, I would go immediately to hell. And so as I knelt there in my dorm room, and I was fortunate to have it to myself that night, my, my roommate was, was out and about, I remember saying to Jesus, I am very concerned about my sins. I'm concerned also about where I'm going to spend eternity, but I think I'm most concerned about the fact that I'm powerless to defeat temptation. I, I wasn't familiar with Romans 7 where Paul talks about the power of sin. You're probably familiar with it. I am now. But there Paul says, when you're under sin's power, there are bad things you don't even want to do, but you can't keep yourselves from doing them. And he says there's good things you want to do, and you don't have what it takes to do them. That's the power of sin. Modern society calls it addiction. Only Jesus can liberate us. Paul goes on to say, what, what can any of us do? And he goes on to say that again, almost in the same breath, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who gives us the victory. Well, that night, I expressed my worries to Jesus. I said, I'm, I've got so much good going for me. I had a beautiful girlfriend. I had a successful athletic career. I had a lot of friends, but I was powerless. And I was truly hell-bent. And that night Jesus met me. He did for me what I couldn't do for myself. There was an immediate transformation, not a complete transformation. All transformation is incremental. The Bible tells us that we go from one degree of glory to another. And I'm continuing to be transformed to the extent that I allow Jesus to transform me. That's some of my story. I later was introduced to the life of the Holy Spirit through some Catholics, believe it or not. And I've continued to make it my aim to live under the Holy Spirit's influence. In the course of time, I found myself living permanently in Minnesota. 
and uh, being involved with the Master's Institute Seminary, and that's where I met Jim, as he mentioned. And I have to say that uh, my relationship with Jim was a, a sheer pleasure. Uh, not every student I've men uh, mentored has been someone as receptive uh, to the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's become a man who is, has, he, he's, he's become a man I'm convinced is intent on continuing to grow closer to Jesus and pleasing him, both as a pastor and as an individual. That's how I know him, uh, know him to be. Although he does have some funny issues about um, uh, milk, some, some really interesting <laughs> issues. He, he tried to convince me that, that almond milk comes from a cow. <laughs> and we actually went around looking uh, you know, in the countryside yesterday for, for that certain species of cow that's called the almond cow. <laughs> maybe, you can, uh, maybe you can help Jim and I with this, with this matter. This morning I want to talk to you about the topic that prayer makes a difference. Specifically, effective praying makes a difference. There's three texts that I want to use that will be our, our, our focus this morning. One is from the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 7.14. Some of you could probably quote it. God was speaking, actually, to uh, Solomon. The temple had just been dedicated, and God was saying to Solomon, essentially, and of course I'm paraphrasing, that a, a time will come when my people will turn away from me. But... But if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. That's a promise. Amen. The second text is 1 John 5, 14 and 15, where John says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. He says, whatever we ask according to God's will, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have obtained the request which we have asked of him. Third text is from Matthew 6, the Gospel. Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10. The disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray. He says, this then is how you should pray. And then he goes on to say, pray, our Father, you're in heaven. May your name be hallowed. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We will uh, unpack those verses more later. Does prayer actually make a difference? I bet everybody's tried prayer. Would you agree? Even people who identify as non-believers will say, tried it, didn't seem to work for me. <laughs> Does prayer actually make a difference? Jesus thought so. Jesus told his followers that if they would pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers, he would do it. He would actually do it. It seems like laborers for the harvest, at least having them, is contingent on Christ's disciples praying that they will come about. Why is this? Because God likes to work through human agency. He does almost nothing except by human agency. Do you really think, I, and I know the answer, it's a rhetorical question, do you really think God needed Moses to raise his staff to part the Red Sea? But that's what he insisted Moses do did he need Moses to keep his hands up in the air so that Joshua could prevail on the battlefield against the Amalekites? Yet every time Joshua or Moses' arms got tired and they lowered, the, the, the Amalekites prevailed against the people of Israel. And so Aaron and Hur come along and they prop up Moses' arms. And as long as those arms are propped up, the battle goes in Israel's favor. We can find many other examples of God working through human agency, especially in the New Testament. God loves to work through human agency. And I have found over the years that God almost always limits his interventions to our requests for them. God is not a micromanager. Jesus thought prayer made a difference. Jesus told Peter that he was going to be tempted to betray Jesus. And he said, but I have prayed for you that your strength will not fail. And Peter's strength did not fail. Jesus thought prayer made a difference. Paul did also, as is evidenced by his many requests for prayer in his epistles. One of them, Ephesians 6.19, pray for me 
so that the opening, so that at the opening of my mouth the words will be given to me, that I might proclaim the gospel, and that I might make it clear as I ought. Paul thought prayer made a difference. So did so did James. James said to the people under his care, You don't have because you don't ask. Chapter 4, verse 2. Chapter 5, verse 16, he said, If you're sick, you need to call for the elders of the church. They need to pray over you with oil. You need to confess your sins, too. He said, the prayer of faith will save that person, will heal that person. He thought that praying made a difference. So did the author of the Hebrews. We don't know who that person is. That person doesn't identify himself or herself. But that author says, pray for us so that I may be restored to you soon. Why does it seem like prayer is a gamble? Like perhaps winning the lottery. It's possible, but not likely. I think, in part, the reason is we confuse merely praying with what the Bible calls effective praying. Not all praying is effective praying, as is seen by the outcomes we experience or don't. James, in five, chapter 5 and verse 16 of his book, makes that point. He says it's the effective prayer of a righteous person that produces the outcomes that delight God. <coughs> the effective prayer. So we need to learn to pray effectively. Would you like to learn to pray a little more effectively today? We pray effectively when we pray in keeping with God's will. We just heard 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Let's Let's think about it again. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that whatever we ask according to his will, we know that he hears us. If we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have obtained the request which we have asked of him. I want to just simply follow that quotation with this question. Doesn't God's will automatically happen? The answer is no. Now, there are some very good followers of Jesus uh, who would disagree with me very emphatically. Theologically, they identify as Calvinists. Calvinists are people, in general, who love the Lord, who have experienced His salvation, who have a high view of Scripture, who want others to experience the life of God. But they have a view of the sovereignty of God that suggests anything that happens is God's will. One of their loudest voices in this generation has uh, written quite a bit about this. He's become very famous. He's a celebrity Christian who lives in the Twin Cities. He has gone so far as to say that if a child is kidnapped, molested, and murdered, God willed that. He desired it. It could not have happened otherwise because God is sovereign and because God is all-powerful. He will add to that. God is loving. He is kind. Maybe he'll help us to understand why he allowed that when we get to eternity. But you must know God willed it. Nothing, nothing, nothing can happen unless God's will it. I don't believe that. I respect him. I think he's a fellow or follower of Christ. But I believe, let me say this in the clearest possible terms, I believe that theology is monstrous. It ascribes to God things that are entirely inconsistent with the person, the life, the teaching, and the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus said to us, he is the embodiment of the Father's will and nature. He said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. The writer to the Hebrews agreed with this. He said, Jesus is the exact imprint of the Father's being and the radiance of his glory. Paul said, similarly, Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Anything Anything at all that happens in life that's inconsistent with the person, the life, the teaching, and the ministry of Jesus is not God's will. Why would Jesus teach us to pray that his will would materialize on earth as it is in heaven if it does already? Sometimes, and by the way, sometimes is an important theological word. Sometimes human will can negate the will of God. Let me give you some examples. Matthew 23, 37. Jesus is on the Mount of Olives. He's weeping over the people, the generations actually, actually, of people who lived in Jerusalem. 
And he's saying, how many times I wanted to gather you as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? How many times? And he says, how many times I? Who is I who is speaking? Certainly Jesus, but who is Jesus? He's God. And remember that Jesus said, I've never said anything except what pleases the Father. I only do what pleases the Father. Jesus speaking is the very heart and the mind and the will of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. How many times I wanted to gather you, Jerusalem? How many times I wanted harmony? I wanted unity. I wanted relationship. I wanted fellowship. But, but, you were unwilling. You were unwilling. God is willing that none perish, but all come to repentance. So, are some people going to perish? The Bible says so. So that means God's will is not always accomplished. Luke wrote this. He's recording this statement. The Pharisees and the scribes of Jesus' day were not willing to accept God's will because they rejected the baptism of John. They weren't willing to do God's will, having rejected the baptism of John. I want to share with you another text that reflects this, Hosea 8.4. This is a text that's, I think, especially interesting, especially in an election season. There are some Christians who believe that whoever gets elected can only get elected because God wills it. And they base this on an important text. And that text is Daniel 2.21. In Daniel 2.21, Nebuchadnezzar is quoted and he learned God set people, he sets people in leadership and he removes people in leadership. But Daniel 2.21 isn't the only text that should inform our thinking on this matter. Hosea 8.4 is a text where God says to the people of Israel, you selected people to lead you who were not men of my choosing. So how does one text inform the other? It informs the other, other this way. They inform each other, I should say, this way. Sometimes people occupy roles of leadership because God wills it. And sometimes they occupy roles because we have willed it. Sometimes people are removed from leadership because God willed it. Sometimes people are removed from leadership because we willed it. Sometimes the will of man can negate the will of God. Sometimes demonic influence interferes with God's will. Luke chapter 13, 11 through 17, Jesus is in a synagogue on the Sabbath, which was his practice. He sees a woman there all hunched over, and he heals her. The synagogue official, the director, found fault with Jesus for doing that. It almost seems unthinkable, but this is, what, this is how religious spirits reacted to Jesus. They would find fault with Jesus no matter what he did. So he heals someone who's been crippled for 18 years. And he rebukes Jesus. And what's Jesus' response? He says, shouldn't this woman, this daughter of Abraham, shouldn't she whom Satan has afflicted for 18 long years, shouldn't she be healed on the Sabbath? Whom did Jesus say afflicted her? Satan. He didn't say my father afflicted her. Jesus never worked at cross purposes with his father. Peter knew this. Peter said to the people gathered in the house of Cornelius, who read about this in Acts 10.38, he said, you guys know about Jesus of Nazareth, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with them. Every person Jesus healed, and there were many, was oppressed of the devil. John the Apostle understood it. He said in 1 John 3, 8, the very first part of the verse, for this purpose the Son of God appeared, to destroy the works of the evil one. It's interesting, the influence of the devil in this world. We see Daniel crying out on behalf of Israel. He prays in Daniel 9. He repents for the sins of Israel as if they are his personal sins. That's what intercessors do. Intercessors understand the concept of corporate responsibility. I'm an American, so I am in some way responsible for the sins of America. I'm a Christian, so I'm in some way responsible for the sins of the church. I'm a member of my family, so I'm in some way 
complicit in the sins of my family. That feels uncomfortable, but it's biblical. And Daniel prays, and he repents on behalf of Israel. And the angel Gabriel appears to him and said, From the moment you began praying, I was sent to you. But the demon prince of Persia interrupted me. He kept me from arriving at the answer. And the archangel Michael came to my rescue. And now I'm able to come to you with your answer. Daniel chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. Interesting text. A demon prince over a region, probably a, a print, what we would call a principality or a power, they were able to delay the answer to a godly man's prayer. Paul says to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, I wanted to come to you, but Satan stopped me. There are other wills that work in the universe. Hence, we need to pray that God's will will come. God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. John Wesley was convinced that nothing happened except, that is to say, nothing of the will of God would happen except an answer to prayer. What does the materialization of God's kingdom and will look like? Most Lutheran churches pray the Lord's Prayer at every worship service. We pray it, but do we actually think what we're praying about? I know that was true of me as a Catholic. I prayed the Lord's Prayer all the time. It was one of the few prayers I knew. I never really stopped to think about what it meant. I'm not pointing this out to find fault or to shame, but to simply say, we just sometimes get in a routine. What, is it, what does it mean for God's kingdom to materialize? Well, what does the materialization of God's kingdom look like? It looks like the king. Who's the king? Jesus. Yeah. What happened when Jesus was on the scene? What happened for sick people when Jesus was on the scene? How did Jesus feel about sickness? What is evidenced in the Bible about this? Because I hear a lot today that God wants you to be sick because he uses sickness to teach you great stuff. The truth is, you can learn great stuff while you're sick because God is awesome and he makes all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. I've heard people say when a person dies, it's always because God willed it. And yet, they base this, I think, on a misunderstanding of Psalm 139.16, where it says we're given an allotment of days. But it's interesting because there are other texts like Ezekiel 13.19 and many others in Proverbs and other places that show that you can, you can be a person who doesn't live out the full number of their days. You can shorten your days and you can actually multiply your days. Isn't that interesting? So the time of death is not predetermined by God. There are many variables that factor into the time of a person's death. But I'd like to live out the full number of my days. How about you? You know, don't you think that if God really willed that some people just die, that when they came to him for, for healing, when they came to Jesus for healing during the days of his earthly ministry, he would have said to at least some of them, no, you know, it's God's will that you have this sickness and that you die now. Don't you think Jesus would have killed a few people right on the spot? That's the, some, that's the Jesus some people have in mind today when they talk about God. But we don't see any of that in Jesus' life. In fact, look at Jesus' record with me. Listen to this. Do you know what percentage of people were refused healing when they requested it from Jesus? That would be zero. Now, add to that consideration this, that there's a strong record in the Bible of what we would call the unsolicited miracles of Jesus. Jesus healed many people who didn't in the hearing of other people request it healing prayer. He had many unsolicited miracles. Add to that that we know Jesus actually wanted to do more, but he was prevented from doing what? You said, really? Seriously? Well, Mark 6, the first five verses, he wanted to do mighty miracles in his hometown, but he couldn't 
the text says. It doesn't say he wouldn't. It says he could not. Why? Just because of the unbelief of the people. Add to that that Jesus shows us in his ministry that some people's illness is caused by demons that are so deeply lodged they could only be dislodged by prayer, fasting, and by faith, revealing that the absence of a miracle isn't proof of the denial of a miracle. Also consider the occasion when Jesus healed the, the blind man of Bethsaida in Mark chapter 8. After Jesus ministers to this man, he says, can you see? And the man says, well, I see people, but they're like trees walking around. Now, if I were standing by, I'd say, wow, that's a miracle. Who goes from stark blindness to severe nearsightedness? <laughs> Here's what Jesus doesn't do. He doesn't say, well, that's amazing. You're good to go. Jesus is not satisfied that his sight was not fully restored. He ministered again until it was fully restored. Add to this that under the influence of the Spirit, James commands people who receive his letter to receive healing prayer from their elders. If you know anything about the New Testament Greek, you know that there are different moods of language. One of them is the imperative. It means what, what a person is saying is a command. James 5.16 is in the imperative. It means that James was not making a suggestion. Suggestion. He was saying, when you're sick, you call. Call those elders. Anytime God issues a command at any time, he's, he's saying in emphatic terms what is essential for our well-being. And I think that's one of the most seldom kept commands in the entire Bible. I can't tell you how many times in my 42 years as a pastor, I've learned that people that I'm serving are sick. Much to my surprise, didn't let anybody know. <laughs> didn't even want to visit. And I'll ask, would you like healing prayer? And you know, I would say probably 95% of the time, I've heard people say, that's okay, Pastor. Hmm. These are professing followers of Jesus who would argue that they believe in being obedient to the Word of God. And that's disobedience. And we wonder why we don't receive more healing. Add to that, that the Holy Spirit influenced John the Apostle to encourage his friend Gaius with these words. I pray that you prosper in our, in our health even as your soul prospers. That's the will of God. Do you know that it's always the will of God to heal? Now I want to add a very important qualifier. I've been a pastor for a long time. Even a, a lot of people who are prayed for don't receive healing. I, I've had chronic back pain, relentless, brutal chronic back pain for many years. And uh, I have to stretch for a significant period of time uh, just to walk, literally to walk normally in the morning. And thank God for stretching. And thank God for chiropractic. And thank God for other therapies I've had. I believe that God does well for me to be more healed than I currently am. And so I find myself not obsessing over my healing, my need for healing, but asking God to show me, Lord, is there some impediment in the way? Is there something that I can remove that will help me to receive this wonderful healing you want me to have? So I'm not here today to tell you that if you've received healing prayer and you're not well, that this means that you have somehow sinned or that you are somehow less than. And I've also learned over the years as a pastor to grieve with people who are grieving, not to judge them, not to shame them. And yet I want to urge people not to accept less than what Jesus died to provide for us. I have a son who's in the Teen Challenge in Central Minnesota in Brainerd. I think this is the 16th rehab he's been to. He's, uh, he's so good looking he can stop traffic. He's 6'3", he's been a model, he is a powerful preacher, he's an amazing communicator of God, he served as a pastor, he had about six years of sobriety before he relapsed while he was in pastoral ministry. And his life since then has been one season of uh, Finding sobriety, followed by relapse, followed by some sobriety, followed by relapse. Lots of trauma, lots of sadness, lots of uncertainty for all of us. I've never felt closer to the brink of insanity than I have as a man who loves his son and has not seen him get well. Right now, he's been in the Teen Challenge for six months. He's clearly the best version of himself we've ever seen. But we never pray, God, if it's your will, deliver you. Why? Because we know his will. Do you know that Jesus never prayed, and if it be thy will, prayer with regard to healing? 
or deliverance from addiction? Do you know that addiction is clearly demonic? Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's evil. It's truly evil. <coughs> I mean, you talk about evidence of the power of sin, wanting to do something good and not being able to do it, not wanting to do something bad and not being able to keep yourself from doing it. And yet Paul adds these words, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's our hope. Jesus is our hope. So I want you to think this morning about what's going on in your circle of influence. Your circle of influence, according to sociologists, includes about 250 people, and that's because of the advent of social media. This would include people in your immediate family, your extended family, neighbors, friends, coworkers, and maybe some even Facebook friends if you have them. I use the word friends very loosely, as I'm sure you do when it comes to social media friends. But what do you see? What do you see beyond that in our nation? Because as a citizen of the United States, is there, is there anything that disturbs you? Anything that, that worries you? And do you know that Paul said to Timothy? He said, Timothy, I want you to urge those under your care. I want you to urge them. That's the language he uses in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 5. Urge those who are under your care to pray. Pray for all men. So pray especially for leaders. And then he adds why. Here's why I want you to pray for them. He adds the words so that. They're important words. So that we, followers of Christ, we might live quiet and peaceful lives and godliness and all dignity. For this pleases God our Savior. Who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth? Paul thought prayer made a difference. He wanted Timothy to urge those under his care to learn to pray, to have a quiet and peaceful life and godliness and dignity, and to help people to experience salvation. We need to be praying this. I want to tell you something. I told the men the other night there's about two things that it takes to get people on my prayer list because I felt especially called to pray in recent years for, certainly for the church, but beyond for America. Usually two things are required to get somebody on my prayer list. One, um, they're, I just know them to be a person of influence that I know they need prayer. Two, they really annoy me. <laughs> they really annoy me. Some of these people are celebrity pastors. There are some people, like the person I was referring to before, a celebrity pastor, a best-selling author, one of the most popular preachers in America, who's telling people, if terrible thing happen, things happen, it's only because God wills it. I pray for him. He's on my prayer list. It's helped me not to be resentful toward him. I'm asking God to bless him and to help him to see what God would like him to know about his own sovereignty. And I pray for certain politicians on the right and on the left, and a few in between. I pray for Supreme Court justices. I pray for people who are in the media, some by name. Some of them are people I admire, and some of them are people I wouldn't trust as far as I could throw them. We must never, ever give ourselves permission to hate. Would you agree with that? That's right. Hate is never okay. We are seeing what the cancel culture does. Let's not allow that spirit to infect us. Amen. Let us, with great mercy, pray for the salvation of all. Ezekiel 33, 11, God says, I'm willing that none perish. He says, he says, I take no pleasure even in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked would repent and live. Amen. The most dangerous people in America from a political standpoint are people who need the love of God. They need the mercy of God. They need the transforming influence of God. This is never a time for Christians to be self-righteous. This is a time for Christians to ask God to be merciful to them as he has to us. Would you agree with that? Amen. So that's what I want to leave you with this morning. I want to leave you with a confidence that your prayers can make a difference if you learn to pray effectively, which means you pray according to the will of God. And again, what is the will of God? It's anything that's consistent with the person, the life, the teaching, and the ministry of Jesus. You know, and if we should find ourselves without resources for life, we need to remember, and this isn't original with me, God still has the recipe for manna. His promises still hold true. 
My God shall supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We need to learn to trust God. It is always God's will to heal. It is always God's will to deliver. It is always God's will to provide for the needs of his people. Give us this day our daily bread we were taught to pray. Let's make sure that we pray this. I have uh, written a number of books, and uh, I usually write PDF books. And, and I write PDF books because they're really inexpensive. And I absorb all the costs myself. And, and I have, and I don't fortunately have editing costs because I have a, a gal who's a generation older than me who served as a teacher for many, many years, and she's way better at grammar and all kinds of other stuff than I am, and she painstakingly works with me in editing my books. But I pay to have them formatted. And uh, a book that I completed about a year ago is called Prayer Makes a Difference. The subtitle is A Beginner's Guide to Intercessory Prayer. I like making PDF books because they're inexpensive to make, but also because I offer them for free. I've never required that anybody pay for any book I've written. If you'd like this book, if you'd like to learn to break, so this isn't a commercial, this is a freebie. I felt Jesus say to me, freely you have received, freely give. And I'm, I'm not against pastors being paid, by the way. I was a pastor for a long time. Still am. But I'm talking about how God is leading me with the things I write. If you'd like that book, you can contact Pastor Jim. And he'll make sure you get a copy of that book. So, shall we pray? Yes. Father, I want to thank you that you are here. I thank you that you are near. We ask to be cleansed afresh with the beautiful, powerful blood of the Lord Jesus. We ask that you synchronize us to your Holy Spirit and fill us with him again. We, we ask you to help us not to hate and help us to pray. Help us to pray because our prayers make a difference. And may we learn, Lord, that... A delay in our answer is not a denial. May we pray always in keeping with the person, the ministry, the teaching, and the life of your Son, the Lord Jesus. And I ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. If you agree with that prayer, would you say amen? Amen. amen. amen.
can't hear a message about prayer and not want to pray, right? I mean, at least me. So, anybody else? One. <laughs> Kevin, come on back. <laughs> I, I, I do know that there are people here today that seriously need prayer. They seriously need God's touch, God's miracle. And so I always uh, try to offer prayer to anybody uh, who's here. And so uh, I know that you may be uncomfortable with this, uh, but this is uh, something that I personally, as a pastor, hold very dear, is the ability to pray for the people that are part of the congregation, that we reach out in love toward one another uh, and ask God for his blessings and healing and deliverance. And so if you're here today and, uh, and you have a need in your life and you would allow us to pray for you, I just wonder if you'd be willing to stand right where you are. And, uh, and I'm not messing with you. <laughs> Can I say it like that? So don't, don't make me call you out. So anybody need prayer, just stand right where you are. So I, I'm personally very thankful for what I'm seeing uh, because that means we need the Lord, right? Amen. And so, can I, can I take a risk? Can I take a risk? Because there's enough of you. Um, we're kind of practicing social distancing, which I'm not a big fan of. I kind of like to touch people uh, in a wholesome, holy way. Uh, and so, would it be okay for you folks just to Stand right up here in the front. Would that be okay? I know, I know. I'm being glared at already. But, you know, let's do me a favor. Let's, because if people, if you would come up here and stand, turn around and face the group of people that's here, we're going to pray. Would that be okay? So, come on, because dinner's burning. Do you believe that when a few moments ago that we confessed our sin to God, that God forgave us? Yes. yes. Amen. So if we're going to ask God to heal, can we have the same expectation that the same God who confesses our sins because he is just and righteous to do so will also bring healing and compassion upon his people because we also ask? Do we believe that? Yes. Amen. All right. I'm very blessed that you folks came up here and stand. So the rest of you, can we all stand together? And pray for God to move. And so let us pray together. Lord, we, uh, we just thank you for your word that just touched our hearts. The, the faith-building, soul-filling, mind-renewing word of God has blessed us today and Lord we reach out to you in faith that you've given each and every one of us a measure to believe you and so we reach out for these that are standing here each one Lord we ask that you would touch them by your power by your compassion and love for them whether it is a, uh, a headache a sore back a terminal illness uh, some type of uh, thing that's troubling their mind, some type of financial thing that's come against their life and threatening their uh, ability to provide. Lord, we reach out to you today. We ask for your healing power, your provisional power, and your compassion to touch each person. We pray that you would rebuke the enemy on their behalf, that just as Kevin preached to us today, that our days aren't necessarily numbered 
They could be shortened or lengthened according uh, to the purposes of God and, and how we uh, maybe reach out to God in faith and believe Him or strive to live for Him in a way that is pleasing, such as honoring our father and mother. Lord, we ask today that you would uh, bless these that have come in that way, that you would extend their days, that you would not only extend them, but you would cause them to thrive and be whole. We boldly ask for these things because of the blood of Jesus that was shed for us to forgive our sins and to heal our diseases. And we ask for these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We all said together, Amen. 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 So you folks, thank you. You can be seated. And, uh, you know, for some reason, if, uh, if you desire prayer today, maybe you feel like you'd like some special uh, prayer, I'm sure that uh, I'd be willing to accommodate that. Kevin would be willing to accommodate that. Um, we'd love to pray for you. So we have a, a song for this thing. Closing song, so just before, yeah, you all sat down, didn't you? <laughs> so that's fine. Do you want to do this a little more? You want to keep going? No. <laughs> Pastor Moses says, we don't preach for an hour, we really haven't preached. <laughs> um, we're going to stand together in a moment, but we got to thank God for our meal. Can you receive a, a kind of a a before we eat benediction. May you go in the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. May the fellowship that we have together around these tables be a blessing to those around us. God, may you manifest your love and your joy to each one of us today as we share a meal together. Amen. So, Lord, we thank you for the food. We thank you for those that are preparing it for us. And uh, we just give you thanks for everything that you're doing here today. Amen. Amen. Amen.